So today I'm going to be talking about understanding, you know, the why, when, and the how. And most of this is going to be about the when and the how, um, because how you approach the downsizing process is contingent upon the answers to those questions. And we found that out after, as I said, 15 years, that there's so much information online about downsizing. And sometimes it's about corporate downsizing, so you have to be more specific in your Google search. But there's a lot of information out there, and they'll, you'll see all kinds of articles and blogs and whatever advice about you know what to do with this and what to do with that. And it's all, it's very micro oriented um, because that's easy to tell people what to do with the half bottles of chemicals under their sink. Um, so for 15 years we've developed a method and have very successfully worked with hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of families and individuals with a process and, and that's what I'm going to explain today. Oops. So when when somebody calls me up and the first question I ask them is, you know, why are you downsizing? What's going on? Tell me about your situation. Because the reason drives the approach. And this might be picking nits, but there are different stressors um, associated with different types of downsizing projects and different expectations. And I'm going to talk through some of that. Oops. So some people, one of the reasons people downsize is they're sick of the clutter. And this happened to be in a state that we also do a lot of liquidation after people pass. And this guy really liked violins <laughs> and all the things that went with violins, like bows and strings and whatever. Um, but a lot of people actually stop from deciding to make a move into a, a smaller place or into a continuing care retirement community or a senior living building because they don't know what to do with all this stuff. It is blocking the door from them making decisions and getting out of that door and into the best place they need to be. Some people are saying, and I had this lady call me up the other day, and she said, I, I don't know when I'm moving, but I don't want to leave all this to my kids. You know, my, my dad was an antique dealer for 55 years. He had over 200,000 square feet of stuff, nine pieces of real estate, and he didn't want to let anything go because the more he had, the more important he felt. And I kept saying, Dad, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Just have an auction. Just have an auction. So... Um, he didn't care about burdening me with, with what to do with all this stuff. But a lot of people's motive is to get rid of it now so that my kids don't have to face this. Because I think they're also secretly afraid of how the ax is going to fall and they're not going to like what their kids do with their stuff. But, you know, they're, I think at, in, at heart they're trying to do something nice to their kids. Oops. Some people are downsizing because they want to be in a safer environment. And I don't know if you can see this. Do these lights dim a bit or no? That's okay. The, when this, this gentleman had an office set up that was probably one quarter the size of this room. Desks, um, credenzas, bookshelves, technology. And he couldn't bend over to replug things. So he would just add a cord. And by the time we disconnected all this and reset him up with the exact same configuration when we moved him, there were four or five boxes of extra cords. <laughs> but it was a very unsafe environment. And so some people are choosing to downsize to maybe get down to one floor. Maybe they can't do the steps or don't want to put themselves through the steps. Um, maybe they have to declutter so they have avenues, safe pathways to navigate through their home. Maybe they have a walker. Um, maybe there's just too much stuff and they have tripping hazards. But that type of downsizing um, and the previous one, when, when, you, when you have those reasons, you don't necessarily have a timeline other than your own imposed timeline, okay? And you may not have to call as much out of your house because you're not leaving your home, okay? And so you can chip away at this or you can bring somebody in and clear some of the space, but the objective isn't quite the same as when you're moving. And, the, and I'm gonna focus mostly on this reason for downsizing because it, in 
involves the most discussion. And most of our projects involve getting people moved. These are a bunch of boxes. This client, we moved them to Savannah, Georgia, and there were 288 boxes. Two truckloads. Three, I think they had to make a third run. So just out of curiosity, I decided to Google, what's the hardest thing to move? And national, there was a survey done in, by National Van Lines, a, a, a nationwide carrier. And they, this is what they asked the guys who were loading the trucks, packing, moving the stuff in and out of the trucks and into your new home. Household appliances, knives and sharp objects, the treadmills, the rowing equipment, grandfather clocks, everyone's scared to death about ruining their grandfather clock. All the little thousand things that are in your curio cabinets and hutches and pianos, obviously. From our perspective as senior move managers, the hardest thing to move is you, okay? And that's because this is typically a time of extreme stress and loss and it's exhausting and difficult. Let me go back to the lost part and not to get down in the mouth here, but when people have to leave their home, it's often because they've lost the ability to live on their own. They've lost physical skills, maybe cognitive skills. Now they're going to lose stuff that they've held on to and that has defined their lives for years and years and years. Maybe they're losing the home they've been in and the home they raised their kids in. And they're going to lose their neighborhood that that home sat in. And, and just the whole idea of losing control because you're getting into that next chapter, that's very, very, that's a big, big pill to swallow. It's often exhausting and difficult because of where you are physically and cognitively. And it, it's a lot of work to get moved. The typical challenges that people face, you know, where do I begin? And again, getting over the hurdle of stuff that is filling their house. Um, other uh, complaints or kind of feelings I, I witnessed and heard, I'm busy, how am I gonna get all this done? I've got pickleball and doctor's appointments. <laughs> and I've got card club and this and that. And, you know, they don't want to give up their current activities and they shouldn't, but there's a lot to do here. I don't have any help. My kids don't, you know, they live in Tanzania and, you know, wherever. They don't live near, nearby to, to give me help. Emotionally, this is so draining because I've got all these decisions to make and I've got to process all my feelings that have to do with everything around me that I've collected and saved and, and, and used. Physically, I'm limited and they're just too damn many decisions to make and what am I gonna do with everything? Moving your lifetime from here to there involves a ton of decision making. Somebody did a survey and said in the average house, there are 300,000 possible decisions. There are 300,000 things in your house that you have to decide, what am I doing with this? And I think that's a low estimate. I truly do from my experience. So I did a little math and I said, if there are 10 rooms in your house and you're gonna spend about three seconds per decision, it's going to take you about 25 hours per room to figure out, am I taking this and this? What am I doing with all these things? It takes time and that creates work for you and emotions and stress. So that's why moving you is the biggest challenge of all. The other bigger challenge besides all of that is the logistics of downsizing and moving and clearing out the house. And I can tell you very, very candidly, when I started this business, you know, I was all dialed in on the client and their stuff. And over the years, particularly in Center County with the highly vigorous housing market we have, the biggest point that I dialed down on in the first meeting was, did you sell your house? Do you have a closing date? What's going on with the house? Because there are so many logistics involved in moving and Historically, at least in the past five or more years, houses are se selling so fast that sometimes 
the, my, my clients were being pushed out of their houses. The process that we used that we found to be incredibly helpful in managing these projects, and for the most part, people were hiring, and this is not an ad, but people were hiring us to manage the projects. You know, they were turning over all of this to us, and I said, we need a plan. You need a plan, you need a plan. Well, I'm gonna, no, you need a plan, okay? <laughs> because there's gonna be a catastrophe if you don't have a plan. You cannot move ahead with this type of project without a plan, or you're, you're setting yourself up for even more stress. Your plan considers, where am I going? And I'm gonna cover all of these in, in order here. When, and the when is what distinguishes the aging in place move or the decluttering, uh, downsizing and the aging in place decluttering, because now you've got time involved in your downsizing project, okay? Because you're, you're gonna leave and go to somewhere new. What am I taking with me? Who can help and how do I get there? Where are you going? I've had people call me up multiple times. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna move and, and I need you to help me get downsized. I say, where are you going? I don't know yet. Well, how do you know what to take? <laughs> I mean, it, you can kind of make some assumptions about, well, I'm moving into a two bedroom cottage or a two bedroom apartment, or I'm gonna move into a studio or whatever. And, but you still, don't know exactly what will fit and work for you. And one of the first things we did, and I'll talk about this in a second, when we met with people was we said, let's we're gonna start with the floor plan because the floor plan is the truth teller and it starts this process of elimination about what will work in your new space. And then you can, you know, say, okay, this is what I'm moving with me and the rest of this I'm not at least from a, what takes up real estate standpoint. And time and time again, people would think they'd have to give up this or that. And I said, no, 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 wait, it might work. But that was only, we could determine that only because we knew what they were moving into. So you can make some assumptions, but it really helps to know where you're going. You know, are you moving out of the area? Or are you staying put? And if you're moving out of the area, what do you want to pay to move with you? I had somebody call me one time <laughs> And he said, <clears throat> um, my, my daughter's moving here from Colorado to State College. And she's got all this stuff that she wants to sell. And I said, well, tell her not to bring it. It's not worth trucking it across America. He said, well, she's going to be here in a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But um, where you're going helps you decide what you can take with you and what will fit, okay? I can't say enough about the when question and, and the timeline. We, I had a lady call me years ago and she said, hi, I'm Shirley, can you help me get moved? And I said, sure, you know, where are you going? Foxdale? I said, oh, when? I don't know yet. And I said, okay, well, let's meet you. The problem is my house is sold. Oh. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times we've had those conversations where they've been catapulted forward into this, this activity called moving and downsizing, and they're being pushed out of their homes because they've agreed to list and show their house and it sells, and they don't know where to go. We moved one couple, two truckloads of stuff into storage, and they stayed in a hotel the month of December because they sold their house too soon and their new place wasn't ready. And recently with COVID and all of the supply chain issues and everything, there've been a, a number of cases where the client is promised that their new place is gonna be ready and it's like six, eight months later, it's still not ready. There's a, you talk about stress, you're waiting eight months and, and then you're starting to doubt that I make the right decision. The when is critical, okay? What is everyone else's timeline? The community or the or the, the place you're buying or the place you're moving into or when's the apartment available? When are the movers available? You know, are you involving family? How about other resources like charities to pick up? Um, locally, in the summer or in the spring, in March, AAUW closes down and there's nowhere for books to go unless it's the trash. 
Centerpiece, which is a phenomenal organization, it's four to six weeks out to schedule them to come pick up at your house. Plus, you have to tell them what's going on in the truck because they have to plan for uh, truck space. And you have to have it all packed and ready for them to grab and go because they're not going to come into your house and pack it up. They have to get to the next place. Well, we need to have the, the basement, you know, th there's a water issue down there and then it's going to need to be repainted. Are those resources available? Movers get incredibly busy. And, um, oh, well, I'm just going to put everything into storage. Well, you cannot get a storage locker. I mean, good luck getting a storage locker come April because they are completely booked by the people that are leaving town and don't want to take their stuff home with them. They want to come back in August and pull it out of the locker. So all of those issues need to be considered or should be if, if you want to cut down on your stress. People say, when should I start to downsize? And all these answers are relevant. Okay, you have to start today. You should have been doing this for a while. When you know your space, I just mentioned that. Before the move, sometimes after the move, we've moved people into places and, you know, there's still 10 boxes of stuff that there's no room for because they didn't receive. And we told them that all these casserole dishes <laughs> are not going to have a home. So, and your storage locker is four by four by eight and it's packed because we loaded it to, to seven feet nine. You don't want to downsize on move day. And by that, I mean, no last minute stuff. We moved a couple. This was a complete nightmare. They they were moving to Florida. Their house sold. Can we get the call? Can you help us move? And I said yes. And so they were going to downsize themselves and make all these decisions. And they went through everything in their enormous big house at least three, if not four times, deciding. They did not want to pay for two trucks to move their stuff down to Florida. I kept telling them, it's not going to fit on one truck. It's not going to fit on one truck. They were going to drive themselves and their two crippled dogs in the car. And they were supposed to leave on a Sunday because the move, we were going to supervise the, move, the pack and the move. And, you know, later, or like Tuesday, I guess. They're still not done downsizing. They're running around the house. This is the day before the, the movers show up to pick up the load. She misses the bottom step, falls. Oh. Sit her down in a chair, put an ice pack on her ankle. They were actually supposed to leave that, that day or the next day. She's crying. She's in pain. The husband's still going through like boxes of paper and stuff. I say, you need to go to the doctor. She had broken her ankle. So they get in the car, they drove 18 straight hours with these dog, two dogs and a broken ankle. Just beat the movers there. Not, but not before the movers said, this isn't gonna fit on one truck and we don't have a second truck because you didn't book it. They didn't, I didn't book it because we were trying to fit on one truck. These people, you can't imagine the distress involved with this move. Because she was, they were still downsizing while the movers were packing the truck. It was a complete disaster. Okay, so we're going to talk now about what are you taking with you? And as I said, the floor plans are an essential tool for giving you some sense of what will fit and work in your new space. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> what I want to say about floor plans is this. They are not exact. Don't go by the corporate produced one that you get an email <laughs> attachment of because that wall that you think is seven feet long may only be six feet long because it's a reasonable facsimile of the way the cottage or apartment is supposed to look. Um, it starts the process of elimination about what you can take with you. Okay, yes, this wall work. Our approach to floor planning is to look at functionally, how do you use your current home and how can we best replicate that in your new space? So, you know, do you need separate bedrooms to sleep in? Do you need a workspace to do quilting or 
separate offices or can you share a desk or do you do everything at the dining room table? How do you live? Where do you sit? Where do you relax? What are you doing? What kind of lighting do you need? Trying to incorporate as much as you, we can about your current lifestyle to minimize that change factor as much as we can. Don't go buy new furniture until you're thin. <laughs> you can make sure it'll fit because <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. Storage, are you going to have storage? Does, you know, is there a, a, a room or a locker? Or are you gonna rent storage? Please don't do that. But if you do, make sure it's not like a year long lease. Um, do you need storage? You know, what are you paying? You're paying to house stuff that you may not go back and open. We emptied a locker. Well, this was years ago. This couple passed away. The nephew was in charge of the estate. This stuff sat in three lockers for 11 years. Can you imagine what that cost? And it was in such poor condition by the time we got to it, we just threw it all out. Uh -huh. I mean, it was horrible. So really, really stop and think, do I want to pay good money to store this stuff because it's expensive? And remember, you're downsizing. That's another key difference between downsizing for a move and downsizing for, you know, aging in place or decluttering. Most of the time, you're going to a much smaller space. That's why they call it downsizing. Okay, so you're, you're really having to thin out a whole lot more than maybe you necessarily would if you were just decluttering or, or trying to you know, reorganize your house to stay there. Okay, who is a big question. Who is going to help you? And this is a truism, you know, people you count on, including families, sometimes get busy can't always be there when you need them. And that's the critical thing, like, I need you next Monday. Well, you know, this week has a soccer game. And, 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 you know, that's okay, but you don't count on help you can't count on. Okay. Oops. How do I get there? Oops. Lots and lots of questions. And how do I get there is the actual physical part of moving. So this is, I'm going to stop here and just say, do you see why you need a plan? I ask more questions than I answer when I meet with people and they get a little frustrated with me, but I can't put a plan together and I can't help you if I don't understand your situation and I need to understand your situation. This is not a plan. <laughs> this is a mind dump of everything that's nagging at you. And I know you can't read it all, but I mean, it's, a, it's like, your grocery list, you know, I need this, I need this, I need this, okay? This is your plan. Where I know where I'm going, I know when, or at least you're close to, you may not have everything nailed down, but you, you, you have an idea and you're not, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Can everyone see that? Okay. Details on how you get there is the mover, anyone who's gonna help you with packing, unpacking, resettling, um, and then the plan for getting the house empty and closing up. When we would move people, you know, lots of times, they, we'd say go, go to St. Louis, go to Pittsburgh, wherever you're moving, go across town, and we would empty the house, get the cleaning service in there. We had people's driveways re-asphalted, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff, but those details need to be factored in. You just, you're not done when the movers drop the boxes off. I can't emphasize this enough. The plan and the timeline are just essential to making this be as minimally stressless, stress free, stress minimal, whatever that, you know what I mean, <laughs> for managing your project, all right? You, you wanna try to not be flying by the seat of your pants. Let me go back to the floor plan for a second. Oh, your, I'm sorry, the plan. Details and dates. Again, who's helping me? Are they available? Are they available when I need them? All right. So as you go through this process, you, the first thing is to do, try to do the floor plan or at least make your wish list. 
So when I meet with people and I say, okay, I'm going to come back on Tuesday, we're going to do a floor plan. I want you to make a wish list room by room of what you'd really like to take with you. And I'm talking about the major stuff. I'm not talking about the hummel or the, you know, the book on the shelf or whatever. I'm talking about what's going to take up real estate. All right. And then you make those major key decisions and then you can start your downsizing. You can start to go through closets and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But this is kind of the flow of how a project like this goes. Okay. And there's a whole lot more to it after that. <laughs> how do you best deal with your stuff? Be decisive. That couple, the lady broke her ankle and had to drive 18 hours straight. They were not decisive. They hemmed, they hawed. What do you think? He said what he thought. She disagreed, they'd argue. I mean, it was crazy. Be decisive. The other big, big, big piece of information I give people is focus on what you care about, okay? And delegate what you don't. You know, why, we had a guy, we were moving this couple to Portland, Oregon. And he did it, confess that he was OCD. So I was like, okay, fine. And I said, you have 10 filing cabinets that legally he had to go through and decide what these documents were about because he was in, in, in medicine and he had to legally deal with his client's files. He's standing in the garage, winding up the broken <laughs> extension cords. I said, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to recycle them. I want to just kick in. He didn't deal with the filing cabinet because he, that was called avoidance strategy, <laughs> right? But what I say to people is if, if you're not moving it with you and it's not important to you, your limited time and energies need to focus on what you do care about and what you do want to move with you, what's on your wish list and beyond that, all right? And then somebody else can take care of what you're not moving with you. Okay, and maybe that's family. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so there are four types of stuff that, in my experience, practical, emotional, hopeful, and then the stuff stuff. And of course, you think everything's really neat and special because it's yours, right? <laughs> okay, so the practical stuff that you have to make decisions on, this is kind of the first layer. And this gets back to the functional, you know, what do you need? If you if you were, you know, running out of your house what, or, or had to flee, what would you take with you? You know, you need a bed, maybe a place to read. You know, we've had people say, well, I need a separate quiet place away from the television to read because I can't stand the noise. Or uh, I had a lady tell me one time, I don't care. I don't need anything else but my card table and chairs because of card club. And that was important to her. Um, so what, what do you need? Think of this as the needs, okay? Then there's the emotional stuff. The stuff in the hutch, books. Books are, people have a strong emotional connection to their books. A lot of times that's because it represents their whole life's work or they're just, you know, maybe they've inherited books or they collect them, but, you know, that, that's usually a more of an emotional connection than a, than a practical one. Um, crafts, we, we've moved more quilters and there are 30 bins of fabric <laughs> trying to wedge it into a two bedroom cottage. Uh, but that was what mattered to them. Their equipment, their, you know, so, okay, that goes up to the top of the, the wish list and, and let's see if we can work that in. But like in the, with the stuff in the hutch, if you're not taking the hutch, but you want everything in it, where's it going to go on the other end? There's another thing to consider. Then there's the hopeful stuff. And I don't know if you can see that basement filled with, you know, that, that person never met hardware they didn't love. And this is bins in the attic. And that's, you know, for all the tea parties you're going to hold. So this is the stuff you hope there's room for. <clears throat> it, it's kind of priority too, but it's still important to, you know, make note of that and, because maybe it will fit. Then there's the really hopeful stuff. Ah. This person had four <laughs> bins of Christmas decorations, four lockers, stored like ten by ten. Oh my! Ah. She could decorate Macy's. 
And, you know, it sat in there for who knows how long. And it wasn't just Christmas, it was every season. And then, then there's the, the stuff stuff. Too much Tupperware. The things that people take too much of, <clears throat> this, paper. Oh, I'm gonna go through that when I get there. Where we're gonna put all these boxes of paper. Oh, and coffee mugs. People take way too many coffee mugs. And the thing that kills me is if when you're moving somebody into a retirement community, I don't know how many times, and you do, <laughs> they give them a coffee mug uh. as a welcome gift. And I keep saying, stop doing that because they're not going to all fit. That's called stuffed stuff right there. Imagine you walk into that and you have to decide, what am I taking from here? We, we moved somebody. We met with this couple last, I forget when, and we walked through their house and, and my husband and I were like shuddering, like, do we want to take this on? We have never said no at that point. We have never said no to a project. And I mean, we've seen some doozies, you know, where we had to wear hazmat clothing and the whole deal. And Bill looked at me and said, you know, and they were moving first and there was a, a, a promissory note they were fine it was just a complicated mess so the pressure's on to make this happen as, as quickly as possible because they're going to be paying all kinds of interest on this promissory note that they had to take out to move where they were going it was unbelievable his office was close to this okay but bill looked at me and he said you know what if we don't do this who's going to help us do Okay, well, so working through the, the process of getting them to decide what was moving, it's like, what are you taking? And he had anxiety. And when he didn't want, we'd schedule work sessions. We're going to work through your office. We're going to work through. He would put headphones on and turn on a training video and totally block us out as though we weren't in the house to work with. He could not cope with all the decision making. So towards the end, we were just grabbing armfuls of stuff. We've never done this in 15 years, but we were, you saw the pictures. We were grabbing armfuls of stuff and just putting it in the box. I don't know, does he need this? The time was up, it was time, the truck's here. And at one point she said, well, I know exactly what I'm moving with me. And I said, the problem is, that you're going on the same truck. <laughs> like, you're set, but he's not. And it, it just was incredibly stressful. And it was because he couldn't face, he created this and he couldn't face the decision making of pulling out of that what he wanted. Oh, this is the coffee mug <laughs> slide. So you can see, you know, really, do you have like 30 people over for coffee at once? I mean, there's a conference room for that. Okay. Okay. So, my simple, simplest advice ever is this. Be decisive about what you're keeping and turn your back on everything else. At least to start, you might have to come back and deal with it, but you're gonna churn. And you know what churn means? Where you, you, know, you, you pick this up and you think, okay, I'm gonna take that, so I'm gonna move it over here. And then you say, well, but that goes here. And before you know it, you've walked all around the house six times and nothing's happening <laughs> constructively, okay? Focus on what you're keeping and turn your back on everything else. And don't waste your time and energy on things you don't care about, okay? The extension cords, right? <laughs> because you have to, you, you wanna end up at the other end whole, okay? You don't wanna corkscrew yourself into the ground with the process. So then what do you do with the stuff you're not moving with you? Well, you have four options, basically. You can keep it, you can give it away, sell if it's saleable, and toss the rest. When I say give away, that's donate, okay? So my parents were in the antique business for 55 years, and there was a heyday when people bought just about everything and anything, and 
It's a different world. And you've read this, you've heard it, and I used to feel horrible telling people this, but they've heard it before I say it. Young people don't want anything besides a cell phone, okay? And for you to get off the back. <laughs> so 11, 10 or 11,000 people a day in America are turning 65, and they're all doing what you're thinking about. They're getting rid of their stuff. And because there's so much stuff, it's called the silver tsunami. You know, the marketplace is flooded with everything from antiques to really nice stuff to like middle of the road stuff to trash. Antiques, the young people don't want it. So you basically have a supply and demand problem. Too much supply, very little demand. On top of that, you know, there are collectors, but they don't want Hummels, Yadros, Victorian furniture, dark brown furniture. They, they, you know what they want? We, we had a client who inherited his grandfather's house and everything in it. We sold a Star Wars collection, little Star Wars, three and five eighths inch characters for $100,000. Oh That's what people want these days. Those who want to buy who aren't getting rid of and are acquiring, they want all the stuff that they couldn't quite afford when they were younger. So now they've got some money in their pocket. They want, you know, Boba Fett. They don't want Yoda. They don't want, you know, Miss Yadro. So you have very few collectors left. Pace and lifestyles have changed, as I just discussed. And people would rather go out and buy something brand new, thank you, Martha Stewart and Target, that looks like what their parents collected and cherished and passed down. You know, nobody wants to pay to clean a fine oriental rug. They want to go to Ollie's and get one that looks like that because it's cheaper than cleaning a good rug. Okay, so if somebody doesn't love your stuff, they're not going to give you money for it. They're not even going to take it if you offer it to them. <laughs> All right, and, and that's just, you know, that's what we've experienced in the 15 years that we've been doing business. So what, I used to ask my dad this all the time, what's this worth? What's this clock worth or this, it's worth what someone will pay you for it today. Not what Aunt Edna said it was worth <laughs> and not what somebody said they purchased it for. The fair market value of an item is usually, unless it's incredible, less than the emotional value that you put on your stuff you know so that in the best case you know you have wrung the value out of your stuff and loved it and used it and have fond associations with it because unless it was a, a, an incredible investment you're not going to make a bunch of money empty in your house okay the other critical thing is in getting rid of stuff there is a cost to getting it out of your house whether it's you or you're paying somebody to do that, there's time, there's a you know, hauling cost. If, if you're paying somebody to haul it out of there, if you're paying somebody to sell it for you, like somebody might put it on eBay, there's a cost to having, you know, paying them to do that or even an eBay fee or you pay an auction fee. Um, the cost has to be less than what you're gonna get for the item in order to make this a viable process. And we've had many, many, many situations where there's a whole house full of stuff left. Just the other day, I had somebody come in and basically it was even Steven. He hauled what was left. There was a nice corner cupboard and dry sink and some other stuff. But he basically said, I'll get this. This is all empty because they wanted to clean the floors before they list the house. And he took it all. He, he took boxes of books to throw out and trash and kitchen stuff and it, and it was a trade a barter and that the cost was off his costs were offset by getting a few things that he could flip okay so people don't think about the cost and, and a lot of the times the biggest cost is time you know how but realtors loved us because we could get houses empty so much faster so that they could get them on the market so the client could realize the revenues from the sale of the house 
so much more quickly than if these people went on their own, you know, and tried to do it themselves or waited for their kids to be available. Okay, so how do you know whether there's, you know, it makes sense to try to sell something? You know, you can talk to appraisers, you know, you can call dealers, you can do a lot of research online, um, families and friends, charities, you know, they're local. Uh, resellers, turn to these resources for help, okay, to try to have some understanding. The other reality is we live in the middle of nowhere here, and it is utopia. I mean, I tell my kids all the time, we, we, we live in such a bubble, it is such a blessing to live in Center County, but when it, get, when it comes down to getting rid of stuff, like getting into the, to the Baltimore or the D.C. or the Philly, where there, there are more buyers and more money and possibly more avenues for getting rid of stuff, it's, you're going to eat up all your profits getting it there. So that's one of the, the downsides of living here in Happy Valley. Okay, other sources of help, and I'm talking about for your entire project, the local Office of Aging and senior service organizations like ACAP, um, Continuing Care Retirement Communities, these are good resources to tap when you're thinking about a move. You know, what are my options? You know, what What's it like? What's it take to get in? You know, talk to people that have moved, your friends, talk to realtors. You know, the more information you can gather, you know, the better. You're not going into this whole thing blind. Moving companies uh, and resources your friends have used. You know, that's probably one of the best resources. You know, people that you know have gone through this process. How did they do this? Learn from what their experience was. So kind of in summary, the three smart approaches to downsizing from our perspective is, you know, do have a plan and work your plan. Do not abort the plan. Be decisive and do practice self-preservation as you go. Because as I said, you want to end up whole at the other end. You want to enjoy where you're going to. I would offer to help, but I'm officially retired. <laughs> and that's why. You know, uh, so I agreed to do this presentation before we drew the line in the sand. So I'm sorry I'm not a resource any longer. <laughs> Don't mean to disappoint, but I've got another job. Yes, you do. Questions? Are you still in your business? I tried, and nobody wanted to buy it. And I feel horrible. I mean, as a first born, you know, type A, I was like, oh, guilt. Who's going to help people? And, uh, you know, I, I need to sell, practice self preservation. So I had to just draw the line in the sand. Are there other companies like yours around? Pittsburgh, Lewisburg, Lancaster. Will they come to the area? You can contact them. So, um, there is an association called NASM, National N A S M M dot org, NASM dot org. Um, they, that's what we were part of, the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. You could go on their website, click on Find a Senior Move Manager, see if they'll come to you. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I. Those are older. Yes. Those are people though that have more training than somebody that's just decided to be a move manager. Is that correct? So yeah, yeah, you have to you get credentialed. I mean, there the move management industry. So the distinction between move management and movers is the movers would walk into your house and they're gonna pack up your cane, your empty glasses, your cell phone. They're gonna pack everything they see, okay? Move managers do this, all this work, this planning. They, don't, they may not do the liquidation part because that was kind of unique with our business, but they will work you through that whole plan I talked about, and then they will get you moved, coordinate the move, and they'll get you unpacked and resettled if you want. And that's what we did. We would move people in and by Mid afternoon, the clothes are hung up, the foods in the fridge, the beds made, the technology is connected, stuff, <coughs> the boxes are gone. That's what we did. 
that's there aren't that I know of other senior move managers in town. I could be wrong, but I don't know that anybody else does all of that. If anyone else does it, they do. Yeah, there are businesses, and if you Google that, you'll, you'll find them. Um, and, you know, there are people that just haul trash, and there are people that might come in and buy things from you. Yes? So, like a specific recommendation, what did you do with tools? So my friend's husband died, he has a whole garage full of, like, good, good stuff. And I think a yard sale probably wouldn't be the best idea. Right. So, you know, one idea is habitat for you. Well, I was going to say that restore. Yeah. You know, yeah. they'll take donations. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But yeah. whether, I mean, if there are antique tools, you might want to go to Apple Hill and ask, is there anybody here that buys antique tools and is willing to come out and look at the stuff? Um, a lot of even tabletop. You know, it's kind of, unless it is for a serious professional, okay. restore, call restore. Okay. Any other questions? No questions online? No. Nope. There, there are no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something you have that maybe your parents gave to you or whatever, it is. There's value in it, but really not to the people that, you, what are you going to do with it? And so you hate to just give it away, but is that really the option? I mean, like, what kind of stuff are you talking about? Coin collection. Well, so what sells today are coins, jewelry, gold, silver, and guns. That stuff has retained... It's value, but even some coins are just worth face value. So there's a coin dealer at Apple Hill Antique. All right, at Apple Hill Antiques. You know, you could Google. You know, I mean, some people sell it on. We've sold collections of coins online. Um, if you find somebody that could do that for you, um, Militaria often sells. You know, people's stuff that their parents brought back from the wars. Um, you know, your best bet is to go online and look for, you know, local antique dealers and mm -hmm. collectors and see what pops up. Okay. But they're going to be very, very particular about what they're <coughs> going to pay money for. Again, because it's, they don't want to tie up their capital in something that they can't turn around and flip and make some money off. Um, yes? About trash or things that you are worn out or you want to just get rid of. Um, how do you go about contacting dumpster people or whatever? Well, candidly, dumpsters are very, very expensive way to get rid of trash. Yes, up to $1,300. If you can even get one because the construction companies usually have them tied up. What we did was we would haul stuff to the dump. And they have different bays to recycle technology, appliances, cardboard, whatever. There are, you know, if you look on nextdoor.com or Facebook Marketplace or, you know, you can find people that will haul it away for you. And it might be worth paying them to do that, again, for your own self-preservation. Yes? I, I think I know the answer to this based on what you said, but... What what magic words do we suggest that people in their fifties could say to their parents who are in their eighties who theoretically <laughs> don't think that they make the downsides? So it so, sounds like there's no hope whatsoever, but I just want to no, make sure. No, that no. no. <laughs> what I would do is very candidly, you know, sit them down and say, "Look, if you wait too long, you won't be a participant in this process." Right. Okay, so. And you may not like that, maybe. And like my dad, he was like, how would that happen? You have an auction. But say to them, look, like this is the reality. If you don't participate, you're out, you're, you know, you're out of the process, you know, either physically, cognitively, or whatever. And um, don't you want to be part of that? My parents, you know, made it a point to um, like give us stuff 
you know, way in advance that he said, you know, like, here, my brother collected cast iron bangs. And my dad had a collection. And so every Christmas he would give them an, a different cast iron bang. And if you can get them to start to think about gifting people with stuff so that you can start to enjoy it now, you know, that's that's one idea. But most of the time, they they do want to participate. So you're kind of sticking it out there like, eh, you're risking, you know, this just happening to you as, a, as opposed to this being your process. What about auctions? Did your father auction this? <sighs> no. <laughs> he was an auctioneer too. Um, <laughs> no. He sold he sold it to a dealer out of Virginia that bought most of it, and then I had to deal with the rest. But I mean, he had a whole lot of stuff that I had, so I had to sell his Tiffany glass collection. He had maybe 26 foot tables of cast iron and tin foil antiques, you know, all kinds of stuff. I still have my mother's 25 boxes of um, women's suffrage and Americana books and papers that someday I'll get around to selling. I hope it's worth a lot of money still. But um, yeah, it, you know, the auction business, you can call the local auctioneers, but it, it has been a difficult road for them because there's no money to be made. And so they don't want to take your stuff unless they can sell your house with it. So that, I, I mean, you can call, I'm not saying don't try, but you, I mean, I've had gone into many situations where they've already talked to the auctioneers who've said no to that. Hmm. Yes. I don't think I have a problem getting rid of my mom's flat scrap dishes and, and, and all her dish sets, but it's all those papers that she kept in piles and things. That's what I'm nervous about going through. And she's struggling to make decisions at this point. Well, you, that's a good question because that paper process, sorting process, takes a lot of time, right? And you don't want to throw something out that somebody needs to, for their estate to be settled. So, you know, the very best thing you can do, like I did this with my dad before he passed away, years before it. I made what my first client called the Jewish death book. So they were Jewish and they're like, we, everything important is in this book. And so I went through my dad's and he, there were, you know, nine different, he, said, he owned all this piece of real estate, nine different electric company uh, uh, contract numbers. And I wrote down every insurance policy, everyone he did business with. And then I got on their list so that they would be allowed to talk to me. You know, and So I made an inventory and I kept one of every bill. And I kept this whole big file of his life so that I could contact them when I needed and then I could cancel out his accounts upon passing. And, you know, you're basically preparing, you know, by inventorying, you know, her world. But, but even canceling out all, all those accounts took you two or three days. Way more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, like I would try to call on his behalf before he passed. You know, and I had to get permission. Like I had to send my powers of attorney documents to them. And so I set it up in advance that they were allowed to talk to me. It's like HIPAA laws, but with electricity, you know, you have to be allowed to talk to these people. And talk, the other thing is, if she has an attorney, it's your mother, right? You said it's your mother? You said it's your mother? mother. Yeah. yeah. Talk to her attorney and find out what should I be gathering? Okay, and how far back do I need to go? You know, always go to the, the professionals about that kind of stuff. This is my very last presentation ever. <laughs> <laughs>
we are um, we have Cindy Keith coming to speak on responding to challenging symptoms related to Alzheimer's and other dementias. So I encourage you to come. ACAP is all about educating folks. And Susan. Winwood House was your sponsor tonight. Yeah. Yes. Right. And there's still some brochures if you didn't grab one. We're on the receiving end of a lot of people that downsize. Um, I started the company in 2001 out in Center Hall. And then in 2014, my son bought me out and he expanded the company to five buildings. So they're around um, Center County. But he sold the company in August of last year and the new owners are from Lancaster. So they're just learning this business. So they contracted with me to stay on for six months. And tonight is my retirement. Oh. <laughs> I have grandkids all around me here. I help all the time with that. But I've been divorced for eight years and I've got a guy now, so we're going traveling. That's my thing. And Susan, I apologize. It's okay. Norm normally we have you up here front and center, but as usual, we we're a little tied up. <laughs> so anyway, thanks everybody for coming. If there's any people left, please help yourself and um, hope to see you next month. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs>